All right. Chapter 9, The Library. All across the district, the Dow and Pumpkins were like a great army marching to save us from certain death. Of course, our lives wouldn't return to normal until the harvest, which was still two months away. And at night, the same blob of Nisma greeted us at supper. But at least it was the start of something better. In the trading center, people began to smile and talk about the future. As the district slowly reclaimed its energy, students at Cachacolo returned to school to resume their studies. But since my parents still couldn't afford the fees, I was forced to stay home. Besides some weeding, there was a little work to do in the field until harvest. I spent a lot of time in the trading center playing Bawa. Someone also taught me a wonderful game called chess, which I played every day. But the games weren't enough to keep my mind stimulated. I needed a better hobby, something to trick my brain into being happy. Day and night, all I could do was think about school. I missed it terribly. Then I remembered that a small library had opened the previous year in Wimby Primary. It was started by a group called the Malawi Teacher Training Authority, and all the books were donated by the American government. Perhaps reading would keep my brain from getting mushy. The library was housed in a small room by the main office. I entered and was greeted by a nice lady who smiled and said, Come to borrow some books? This was Miss Edith Sicolo, who taught English and Social Studies at Wimby, and acted as the school librarian. I nodded then asked, how do I do it? It was my first time ever seeing such a thing. Miss Sicolo pulled back a curtain to reveal three giant shelves that nearly reached the ceiling, each filled with books. The air smelled sweet and musty, an aroma I'd find comforting from that day forward. She explained the rules of, of borrowing books, then showed me the many titles available. I expected to find primary readers and other boring Malawian textbooks, to my, but to my surprise, these books came from all over the world, places like America and England, Zimbabwe and Zambia. I saw books on English, history and science, even novels for leisurely reading. I spent hours that morning sitting on the floor, flipping through pages and marveling at the pictures. For the first time in my life, I experienced what it felt like to escape without going anywhere. The books from other countries were especially fascinating, but I ended up checking out the same Malawian textbooks my friends were studying at school. It was the end of the semester, and my plan was to get caught up before classes started again. Back at home, I fashioned a hammock from flower sacks and strung, in, strung it between two trees. I spent my mornings at the library, and during the warm afternoons, I read in the shade. Right after, Gilbert offered to help me with my independent studies. Each day after school, he stopped by and explained the lessons. What did you cover in science, I'd ask. Weather patterns. Can I see your notes? For sure. But as much as I loved to read, I found it terribly difficult. For one, my English was bad, and sounding out words took a great deal of time and energy. Plus, some of the material was confusing since I didn't have a teacher to explain things. In agriculture, I asked Gilbert, what do you mean by weathering? It's when rain breaks apart the rocks and soil. Ah, oh, I got it. One Saturday, Gilbert met me at the library just to look at books for fun. He couldn't study all the time. The first thing I spotted was the Malawi Junior Integrated Science Book used by the older high school students. Inside were lots of diagrams and photos of strange and interesting things. Peoples with, people with rabies and chickens stricken with kwashakora, like so many who'd wandered our country. One picture showed a man in a puffy silver suit. What's happening here, I asked. It says he's walking on the moon, Gilbert said. Impossible. Turning the pages, I saw a photo of Nakula Falls on the Shire River located in southern Malawi. It's where ESCOM operated the hydro plant I mentioned earlier and where the country got its electricity. The only information I had was that the river flowed downhill until it reached the plant. Then poof, there was power. And how, how and why this worked, I had no clue. But this book explained everything. It said that the water turned a giant wheel at the plant called a turbine, and the turbine produced the electricity. Well, I told Gilbert, this sounds exactly like the bicycle dynamo. It lights the bulb by also turning a wheel. The photo of Nakula Falls made me think about the dambo behind my house. During the rainy season, there was always a waterfall. What if we put a dynamo underneath it, I said. The falling water could do the same spinning 
and produce electricity. We could listen to the radio whenever we wanted. The only problem would be running wires all the way to my house, which could cost a fortune. And what would I do the rest of the year when the marsh was just a soggy swamp? I guess I'll have to research this a little more, I said. Later that day, we came across another fascinating book called Explaining Physics. It was also filled with photos and illustrations, mainly from England. To my surprise, it answered many of the questions I've been asking for a long time, such as how engines burn gasoline in order to move, or how a CD players or how CD players read the music on the shiny disc. For those of you wondering the same, it uses a laser beam. I found an entire section of, on batteries. Another photo demonstrated how brakes on a car worked. I'd also assumed that cars use strips of rubber to stop the wheels like a bicycle. This book said otherwise. Vacuum brakes, I said. Wow, Gilbert, I really need to borrow this book. But explaining physics was way more difficult to read than integrated science. The words and phrases were long and complicated and not always easy to translate. After a while, I devised my own system by reading words in context. For example, if I was interested in a photo or illustration labeled figure 10 and I didn't know what it meant, I'd comb through the text until I found where figure 10 was mentioned. Then I'd study all the words and sentences around it, often asking Miss Siccolo to look them up in a dictionary. Can you look up the word voltage? I asked. Sure. Any others? Resistor. Oh, and diode. Slowly, this is how I began learning English, as well as the sciences that would soon capture my imagination. After a couple of weeks of reading this book, I came across the most amazing chapter, the discussion of magnets. I knew a little about magnets because they found, they're found in radio speakers. I'd busted off a few and taken them to school as toys, moving slivers of metal around through a piece of paper. The book explained how all magnets have north and south poles. The north pole of one magnet would stick to the south pole of another, while identical poles were always resist. You've probably experienced this when playing around with these things. In fact, the earth itself has a liquid iron core that acts like a giant bar magnet in relation to its poles. Magnets, like the earth, have natural force fields that radiate between the poles. The south end of a bar magnet will always be pulled toward the north pole of the earth. That's how a compass works. The bar magnet inside always pulls north to keep you from getting lost. The most fascinating section about electromagnets, which work by applying power to a coil of wire. According to the book, you can make them out of everyday objects, such as nails and batteries. When electricity from a power source, such as a battery, passes through a coil of water, sorry, passes through a coil of wire, it creates a magnetic field. This magnetic, magnetic field can be greater if the wire is wrapped around a good conductor, like a nail. The more it's wrapped, the stronger the electromagnet. The strength can also be increased by using thicker wire or by applying more power. The book showed giant electromagnets picking up cars and heavy pieces of metal, but smaller ones, it explained, help power simple motors in things like radios and car alternators. Aha, I said loudly, they're all talking about radios. I was sitting in my hammock when I read the piece of information. It had taken me over a month to get this far in the chapter, mainly because of all the strange English words to learn. But now I'd reached the juiciest part. How do these motors work? Well, in a simple electric motor, a coil of wire on a shaft, of, on a shaft sits inside a casing that's actually a large magnet. I knew this much by taking apart a radio motor and unraveling the copper wire, mainly to make toys and stuff. When this coil of water is connected to a battery or any power source, and it becomes magnetized, it gets all charged up and wants to fight with the other magnets surrounding it. The push and pull between their opposing poles causes the shaft to spin. You know the fans that we use in the summer to keep cool? The blades are spinning around and around because of the fight going on inside. During all this fighting and spinning around, these motors produce their own kind of energy called alternating current or AC. There's a second kind of energy called direct current or DC, but that's mostly found in batteries. Direct current flows in one direction, from one end of the battery to the other. 
while AC changes direction and can be used in more ways. It's also easier to transmit. Because of this, most electronics use AC power. The book gave an example of an AC generating motor, a bicycle dynamo. Aha, I said again, remembering back when Jeffrey and I were playing with the dynamo and trying to power the radio. It didn't work when we, wa when we attached the wires to the battery terminals, which only used direct current. But when we jammed them into the hole that said AC, the radio had come to life. The book went on. The movement of energy of the dynamo is provided by the rider. Of course, I thought. That's how the spinning motion generator generates power in a dynamo and in the SCOM turbines on the river. I can tell you how exciting this was for me, even if the words and phrases sometimes confuse me. The drawings were clear in my mind. It was like seeing an entirely new language composed of symbols, those for AC and DC, positive and negative, batteries and switches and circuit, and various arrows showing the directions of current. Right away, I understood this language clearly, as if my brain had known it all along. About a month later, school ended for the semester and Gilbert had more time to hang out. One morning we went to the library, but as soon as we arrived, Miss Sicolo hurried us to leave. You boys spend hours in here taking my time, she said, but today I have an appointment. Just find something quickly. The reason it also took so long was because the books were in disarray. They weren't shelved alphabetically or by subject, which meant we had to scan every title to find something we liked. That day, as Gilbert and I looked for something good, I remembered an English word that had stumped me in one of the other books. Gilbert, what does the word grapes mean? Hmm, he said. Never heard it before. Let's look it up in the dictionary. The English Chickawa dictionaries were kept on the bottom shelf. I'd always used the one on Miss Sicolo's desk, but given her mood, I didn't dare ask her for it. I squatted down to grab another dictionary, and when I did, I noticed a book I'd never seen. It was pushed deep into the shelf and slightly hidden. What's this, I wondered. Pulling it out, I saw it was a textbook from American from America called Using Energy, and this book had since changed my life. The cover featured a long row of windmills, though, uh, though at the time I had no idea what a windmill was. All I saw were tall white towers with three blades spinning like a fan. Gilbert, I said, calling him over, don't these look like the pinwheels that you, me, and Jeffrey used to make? We used to find old plastic water bottles in the trading center. We'd cut the sides into blades like a fan, drive a nail through the lid, and then hang them on a stick. The wind would spin the blades, a kid's toy. Yeah, he said, you're right, but these are giant. What are they for? Well, let's find out. Energy is all around you every day, the book said. Sometimes energy needs to be converted to another form before it can be useful to us. How can we convert forms of energy? Read on and you'll see. I read on. Imagine that hostile forces have invaded your town, and defeat seems certain. If you needed a hero to save the day, it's unlikely you would go to the nearest university and drag a scientist to the battlefront. Yet, according to legend, it was not a general who saved the Greek city of Syracuse when the Roman fleet attacked it in 214 BC. It explained how Archimedes used his death ray, which was really a lot of mirrors, to reflect the sun onto the enemy ship until one by one they caught fire and sank. That was an example of how you could use the sun to produce energy. Just like the sun, windmills could also be used to generate power. People throughout Europe and the Middle East used windmills for pumping water and grinding grain, it said. When many wind machines are grouped together on wind farms, they can generate as much electricity as a power plant. If all snapped together, I turned to Gilbert to see if he was reading the same stuff. If the wind spins the blades of a windmill, I said, and the dynamo works by turning the pedals, these two things could work together. I remembered that I remembered what the book had said about the dynamo. The, the movement energy is provided by the rider. Gilbert, the rider is the wind. If I could somehow get the wind to spin the blades on a windmill and rotate the magnets, magnets in a dynamo, I could create electricity. And if I attached a wire to the dynamo, I could power anything, especially a light bulb. 
All I needed was a windmill and I could have lights. No more smoky lanterns that left us with sore throats and hacking coughs. With a windmill, I could stay awake and read instead of going to bed at seven with the rest of, the, rest of Malawi. But most important, a windmill could also pump water. With most of Malawi still reeling from the famine, a water pump could do wonders. At home, we had a small, shallow well that my mother used for cleaning. The only way to get the water was by bucket and rope. But if I attached a windmill to and pump to the well, I could pipe water into our fields. My God, I thought, we could harvest two times per year. While the rest of Malawi went hungry during December and January, we'd be picking our second crop of maize. The pump could also allow my mother a year-round garden to grow things like potatoes, mustard greens, and soybeans, both to eat and sell at market. I began to get excited. No more skipping breakfast, Gilbert. No more dropping out of school. With a windmill, we'd finally release ourselves from the troubles of darkness and hunger. A windmill meant that the more than just power, it was freedom. Gilbert, I'm going to build a windmill. I'd never tried anything like it before, but I knew that if someone else could build them in Europe and America, then I could build one on Malawi. Gilbert smiled. When do we start? We start today. In my mind, I could picture the windmill I wanted to build, but before I attempted something so big, I wanted to experiment with a smaller model. I'd still need the same materials, blades, a shaft and rotor, wire, and something like a dynamo or small motor to generate electricity from the moving blades. Jeffrey and I had used regular sized water bottles for our pinwheels, but now I needed something stronger. Back at home, I started looking around and spotted just the thing. It was an empty jar of body care lotion that my sisters used to play cricket. It was plastic and shaped like a tub of margarine with a screw top lid. Perfect. Leaving the lid intact, I removed the bottom of the, the bow. I removed the bottom with a bow saw, then cut the sides into four strips and fanned them out like blades. I poked a hole through the center of the lid and nailed it to the bamboo pole, which I drove into the ground behind the kitchen. Right away, I realized the blades were too short to catch the wind. I needed to make them longer. In our village, we took our baths in a tiny hut made from grass that was open at the top. We typically installed plastic PVC pipe under the floors to keep them from flooding. Not long before, my Aunt Chrissy's bathhouse had collapsed in the storm, so they built a new one right beside it. The old one was still there, however, and I knew that they must have some pipe buried beneath the rubble. After 20 minutes of digging around, I managed to pull it free. I sawed off a long section, then cut it down the middle from the top to bottom. Back in my mother's kitchen, I stoked the fire until the coals were red, and then held the pipe aloft over the heat. The plastic began to warp and blackened as it melted. Soon it was soft and easy to bend, like wet banana leaves. Before it could cool down and harden, I laid it on the ground and pressed it flat with an iron sheet. Using the saw, I then carved four blades each one measuring 20 centimeters in length. Once again, I didn't have the right kind of tool, so I had to improvise. This time, I needed a drill. Looking around my room, I found a long nail and took it to the kitchen. First, I drove the tip through a maize cob to create a handle, then placed the nail on the coals. Once it glowed hot, I poked holes in both sets of plastic blades. I used some wire to connect them to the bottle but I didn't have any pliers to twist it tight. Instead, I used two bicycle spokes. That's when my mother found me. What are you doing messing up my kitchen, she said. If there was one thing she hated, it was kids messing up her kitchen. Get these toys out of here. I tried to explain about the windmill and my plans to generate power, but all she saw was some mangled pieces of plastic and a bamboo stick. Even little children play with more sensible things, she said. Go help your father in the fields. But I'm building something. Something what? Something for the future. I'll tell you something for the future, she said, and scooted me out the door. It was pointless to try to explain. What I needed now was a bicycle dynamo or motor, and I had no idea where I could find one. Of course I knew where I could buy one. A shopkeeper named Dodd had one for sale at the hardware store in the trading center. I'd seen it on a shelf in the months before the famine, wrapped in plastic, so shiny and so out of reach. I went back this time, and sure enough, it was still there. Dodd smiled when I approached, so I tried my charm. 
Fine day, Mr. Dodd, I said. Yes, fine day. Your family? Oh, fine. Fine, thanks for asking. Say, how much for the diamond ammo behind you? Five hundred. I leaned forward and gave him the sorriest look I could muster. Yes, but you see, Mr. Dodd, I don't have five hundred. He laughed. Ah, you know how it works. Go find the money and come back. It will be here, and if not, I can always order another. I could get the money doing Ganyu work, maybe some odd jobs here and there. In fact, I'd heard that guys were making 100 kwacha a day unloading trucks at a dry goods store. If I worked for a week, I could have enough money. I headed right over to the store and was one of the first ones there. I'll get hired for sure, I thought. I waited and waited. Morning became afternoon. The sun grew dreadful, and I'd forgotten my water. Finally, the owner walked out. Why do you keep standing here, he asked. I'm waiting for the trucks. They come every day, he said, except Monday. Just my luck. It was Monday. That night at home, I hit upon another idea. The bicycle dom dynamo was the ideal motor for a large windmill. I wanted to, for a large one windmill I wanted to make. But for the test model, I could get by by using the much smaller generator. I knew just where to find one. I walked over to Jeffrey's house and found him in his room. Hey, Bombo, do you remember where we put that international radio and cassette player? Yeah, it's here someplace. Why? I want to use its motor to generate electricity. Electricity? Yeah, from a windmill. Every time Gilbert and I had visited the library, Jeffrey said he was too busy working the fields. To be honest, he didn't seem interested anyway. We're headed to the library, we'd say. Want to come? Go ahead, he'd answer. Waste your time. But now, when I told him my idea of building a windmill that would produce power, and then showing him what I'd built so far, he saw things differently. Cool. Where did you get such an idea? The library. Jeffrey found the international cassette player under his bed, and I went to work. My screwdriver in this case was really a bicycle spoke that I'd hammered flat against a stone. It wasn't anything pretty, but it worked to remove the screws from the radio's casing to allow me inside. After a little prying and jiggling, I removed the cassette deck and found the motor. It was half as long as my index finger and shaped like a AAA battery. A short piece of metal stuck out from the top like a stem. Attached was a small copper wheel that spun in magnets inside and gave the radio its energy. Using some wire, I attached the motor to the windmill. My, di my idea was to have the body care lid turn the copper wheel as it was spinning, like two gears in, a, in motion. But when I spun the lid, it just slipped against the copper. It needed some friction to make the gears catch. What we need here is some rubber, I told Jeffrey. Yeah, but where do we get it? I don't know. What about from a pair of shoes? Now you're thinking. The rubber from our flip-flops was too spongy and not durable enough. Otherwise, we'd be set. Everyone in Malawi wore flip-flops. We needed a special kind of rubber, the kind used to make the flats worn by most women in Wimby. There was only one problem. A company called Shore Rubber was going through the villages collecting old shoes to recycle and make new ones. They were offering half a kilo of salt for each pair, so of course most women took the deal. I wondered if it was even possible to find used shoes anymore, but it was worth a try. All day Jeffrey and I dug through garbage piles all over Masatala and Wimby looking for these shoes. Finally, after sifting through mounds of peanut shells, banana peels, and old rusty cans, Jeffrey held up a shoe. One shoe! Tonga! The black flat had been buried so long it was now gray and filled with crusty muck. It smelled like goat skin. Good job, chap, I said. Using my knife, I carefully carved an O-shaped piece out of the rubber, small enough to slide over the motor's copper wheel like a cap. It took more than an hour to do, but once I pressed it on, the two gears caught just right. The next step was to test the motor to see if it produced current. Jeffrey began spinning the blades by hand, and I took the motor's two wires and touched them to my tongue. Feel anything, he asked? Yeah, tickles. Good, then it works. Now the question was, what should we power using this little windmill? We decided it would be Jeffrey's favorite radio, an old Panasonic that he listened to while he worked in the fields. Jeffrey loved his Billy Conda music. And sometimes I'd even sneak up on him in the maze rows and catch him dancing. I held the windmill while Jeffrey popped off the Panasonic battery cover and removed the cells. Using my knowledge from the books, I assumed that because the radio operated on batteries, 
its motor produced DC power, which meant we could connect the wires straight to the radio's, posi radio's positive and negative terminals. Jeffrey pushed the wires inside, then twisted them so they connected to the heads. What do we do now? He asked. Now we wait for the wind to turn the blades. Just as I was saying that, the wind began, the wind began to blow. My blade started to spin and the wheel began to turn. The radio popped and whistled and suddenly there was music. It was my favorite group, the Black Missionaries on Radio 2, singing their great song, We Are Chosen, Just Like Moses. I jumped so high, I nearly disconnected the wires. You hear that, I screamed? We did it. It actually works. At last, Jeffrey said. Now, I'll go even bigger. Superpower. The success of my small windmill gave me confidence to attempt an even bigger machine, and I'd already started making a list of materials. I would still use PVC pipes for the blades, though I'd need much longer pieces. The blades would have to be would have to attach to a rotor, which needed to be some kind of flat metal disc, plus I'd need a shaft or axle to make it all spin. The best thing I could think of was the bottom bracket of a bicycle. The bracket, or gav, as we called it, is what attaches the bicycle pedals to the crankshaft crank set and turns the chain to spin the back wheel. But in this case, I'd replace the pedals with blades. When the blades began, when the blades, mm, when the back wheel spun, I'd have a dynamo, dynamo attached to generate the power. Basically, I was going to hoist a bicycle into the air like a flag to catch the wind. Just trying to imagine it made me laugh. But of course, none of this changed the fact that I still had no money to buy materials. So like the smaller machine, I had to go and find them on my own. For the next month, I woke up early and went searching for windmill pieces like I was exploring for treasures. The best, best place I knew was an old tobacco plantation across from Cachacola School. The abandoned garage and scrapyard were littered with machine parts and stripped bodies of cars and tractors, all forgotten and left to rust. Gilbert and I used to play around there, but never had much use for the junk. Now I was returning to the yard with a mission. I set out one morning over the hills and streams, noticing how the land hadn't changed much since the end of the rains. The grass was still high and started to fade to brown, but the maize in the fields was tall and green. Soon we'd been harvesting and our own problems would be over, at least for a year. At the school, I turned into the plantation and stopped at the entrance to the scrapyard. Behold, now that I had an actual purpose and a plan, I realized just how much treasure lay before me. Old water pumps, tractor rims half the size of my body, filters, hoses, old pipes, and plows. Several stripped car bodies lay bleached by the sun in addition to two abandoned tractors. They had no tires or engines, just rusted gearboxes in their bellies. Inside the cabs, the glass was busted off the instrument panels, but the steering wheel, clutch, and pedals were all still intact. Aside from the sound of grass swaying in the wind, the scrapyard was silent, and it, I was beautifully alone. The first afternoon, I discovered a large tractor fan in perfect design for my rotor. I could bolt the PVC blades directly to the metal blades on the fan. The same day, I found a giant shock absorber which I banged it against an engine block to knock off the casing. Inside was a long piston, the ideal windmill shaft. I needed some kind of ball bearing to connect the shock absorber and gav to reduce the friction. In order to find the right size, I used a piece of rope as a measuring tape and went around to all the various shafts and bearings attached. After three days, I found the right match on an old peanut grinding machine. I used a rusted coil spring to bang the bearings loose and found it was in pristine condition. The only problem with the scrapyard was that it sat directly across from Catchacola School where I'd left a bit of my heart. The school was currently empty until students, in a few, until students returned in a few short weeks. I could see through the windows for a brief, brief moment I imagined myself back at my desk. Look out, I said. Your man... Kawakamba will be there soon. That's chapter 9.